Greetings, Mind Crafters, and welcome to another exciting Mindcraft episode. My name is Kimberly Quinn. I've got little Giovanni here next to me taking a schnooze. Uh, beautiful, very soggy day in, uh, in November in northern Vermont. And uh, it's, it's stick season, which I personally love here. Super wet day. I think it's very contemplative. If, I know I mentioned this in the last one. If you've, if you've ever listened to George Winston, it just when you look outside, it it looks like a like the like the George Winston CD sounds fall into winter, winter into spring, and they're beautiful. In fact, I saw him in, in concert years ago. But anyway, so what I'm inspired to chat about today is worthiness as a practice to actually practice feeling worthy. And I think many of us don't think of it that way. We you know we kind of think that. The worthiness fairy is going to just, you know, kind of swoop in while we're sleeping and drop worthiness fairy dust. And I know I use that example for lots of things. And it's true, though. It's same thing with happiness, same thing with lots of things, forgiveness. We think it's just all going to happen without making a choice and without making, you know, a conscious choice to forgive, a conscious choice to be happy, a conscious choice to feel worthy. We think it's just, you know, like, it, I don't know, like you win that the worthiness ticket, a lottery ticket or something. And that's not how it works. It's, and for some, it'll take more work than others, obviously, depending on, on childhood and uh, all the very, all the factors that go into that. And uh, however, no matter who has what happening, we can all make a choice to be happy. We can all make a choice to forgive. We can let go, however you want to say it. We can all make a choice to, to, to feel worthy. We can actually choose it because thoughts come first and feelings second, right? So we can't feel worthy. Because since thoughts, thoughts create feelings, we cannot feel worthy without thinking worthy thoughts first. It's neurologically impossible. So we're going to talk about that today because I'm inspired for one and it's extremely important. That's it because, it, you know, basically the world as we, as we know it revolves around our own self-value. Our world revolves on our self-value, all of it because we teach people how to treat us. So if we're walking around not feeling worthy. We're going to teach other people to not treat us well too. That's just how it goes. And the reverse is also true. You feel in the, you know, you feel in the value, you feel in the swag and, you know, and then you walk in the room and people can just feel the vibes that you, you like yourself, you love yourself, you're confident, the whole deal. So we're going to talk about that today. And so, uh, I think many of you know I write for psychology today, which is loads of fun. It, it really is fun. I do write these little two or three page articles and it, it is, uh, it's just, it's very, very enjoyable. So a long, not a long time ago, it's 2023. So it couldn't have been that long ago. This year, earlier this year, I think it was March. Anyway, I, I wrote an article about this exact topic about worthiness as, as a practice. And so Psychology Today, I've been writing for, for them for oh, years. I don't even know how many. And they've changed things a little bit. For, and for the better, it kind of has evolved. And they start out with three key points, which actually I kind of like that because as a reader, I enjoy that because you can tell in the first, it, it's, a, it's a life minute saver, right? Because you know in the first, you know, if you have three three points, you can kind of glance over those and you can save life minutes. If it looks like it's going to be a total dud, then you don't jump in, right? On the writing end of it, it's also very focusing. And especially, especially for my lovely, wild and wonderful, neurodivergent, fast mind, it's nice to have a focusing agent to write. So the first of the three points is knowing your value is essential for self-care. And I like to just stay there for a second. Brene Brown does a lot on this. And as I was just saying about, you know, how we teach people how to treat us, this is very, very true. So she does a lot uh, about this with boundary setting because in her research, she, she realized that the people who are the best boundary setters are, are also the most compassionate. And the reason they're most, most compassionate, they're compassionate with themselves. They can be compassionate with other people because they value themselves. It's very difficult to set an appropriate, respectful boundary. If you're not valuing you, it's very difficult to take care of a self you don't value. It's just hard. You know, it's, it's hard to, you know, splurge on that, uh, you know, fancier dessert at a restaurant that costs $2 more. Like, no, we're not even conscious of it usually. Right. Um, 
it, you know, to, to go to, to kind of carve out in the budget that, you know, that, that massage around your birthday time or things like that, you know, I could pay other things. I could do other things and to, to, uh, and there are certainly times like that. I don't even want to make light of that at all. I'm saying it, this is about the intention, the intention to, to carve out whatever for yourself, the intention to take out time for yourself, you know, like young mothers, it's super tough. That was my first book was about that because young mothers get so conditioned to uh, not having any time for the self at all that, you know, we got, we got swallowed up whole. It doesn't mean we don't love our kids. Of course we love our kids. We love them so much. We're, you know, we're putting them first all the time, which is fantastic. That's how it goes. Yet it's that old oxygen mask first thing and having a little mama time with, with women, friends. And um, it's, if you're jugg- also juggling a career, you got to still have to carve out time away from both of those things. So we can't, we really aren't in a place to do this if we don't value the self. What, what we will do is burn out because we don't treat ourselves well, because we don't value ourselves. We burn it at both ends, you know, get the flu, da, 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 cause, cause, because if something, something's got to give. We can't do, no one can be everybody's everything all the time and survive it. So something has to give. And if you don't value yourself, it's going to be you. And so the second point is, the, the second point I, I that I wrote is, like anything else, worthiness takes practice to get better at. So I have this talk frequently with my mind crafters, which is we whatever we practice, we get better at. It can be the violin, it can be cooking, it can be skiing, and it, it can be robbing banks. I didn't, when I use that example, they laugh. But here's the thing, you know, many of us, many of us, many of us, because we're creatures of habit, we are practicing things that aren't good for us frequently, right? We're, we practice things that aren't good for us frequently. So we can also flip the script script on that and practice practice worthiness, which means thoughts come first, feelings second, right? So there are all kinds of ways we can do that. Personally, you know, I'm a big fan of Sarah Von Brednick's book, Simple Abundance. She's got, in a, she wrote it specifically for women, doesn't mean you can't re- read it if you don't identi- identify as female because she has so much, there's just so, so much good stuff in there that anyone could benefit, um, women in particular, since that was sort of her, her target. Um, but, but there's so, or if that's not your book choice, there are all kinds of positive affirmation books. There's also, there are also guided meditations out there that are, are geared specifically to, to self-value and centering oneself. Of course, professional treatment also helps. And uh, there are all kinds of things we can do. We can we can get creative with construction paper and markers and write positive things on the strategic places in the house where we are most of the day. So maybe on the fridge, maybe one, you know, uh, taped to the laundry machine, you know, somewhere in the bathroom, somewhere in your bedroom on the nightstand, you know, write some nice thing to yourself and maybe and change it up. Maybe if not, if you don't have the time for every day, change it up every week. There's all kinds of things we can do. We can also fact check when, um, you know, the thought ambushes happen. You know, when the thought ambushes happen with that old negative dialogue that's coming from the vault that's been going on for years to really, really fact check with it. And then we say to ourselves, what's going on with this dialogue and what... What about, you know, this thought, that thought, whatever, what about these thoughts may not be true about me? What about these thoughts may not be true about me? And we have to really be a a sort of, I forget assertive, I'd say aggressive, aggressive about, about, um, the reprogramming thing and dismantling those old thoughts, which have turned into beliefs. That's a little tougher. So you gotta really stay with it because basically beliefs are just thoughts we continue to think over and over and over again. The brain loves patterns. Well, the good news is the brain's not in in charge. And it sounds like a duality. We're in charge of the brain. So whatever we've learned, we can unlearn. And then we can re, we can, we can teach the brain the new patterns. That is 100% up to us. And then the third point that I discussed in the Psych Today article is that keeping ourselves filled up is our number one job. Number one. Um, what is in the cup is for us. The overflow is for everyone else. And let's go back to the, to the first part of that. Keeping ourselves as filled up as, filled up as our number one job. And my good friend Oprah talks about that a lot. I, 
again, I'd like to say we're very tight. She just isn't aware. And I do hope to meet her someday because I think that she is absolutely amazing. And she talks about that. And she's very funny when she talks about that. In fact, I use a little three minute clip and I don't know which episode it came from when I do talks on self-care and the, the title of the, my talk is hashtag self-care is not selfish with the N-O-T being in capitals because so many people, we have such, you know, selfishness. There are two kinds of selfish. One is sort of positive and a good way to be. The other one is negative and not a great way to be, right? Just, you know, just, you know, having our, our sights set on just, you know, you know, and I guess like, I don't want to say that's so severe to say narcissistic way because we're not necessarily talking about such a far stretch. It can be that, but just it can be sort of regular, just not listening to people, you know, the whole thing versus authentically taking care of ourselves, authentically keeping ourselves filled up because here's the deal. We cannot give what we do not have. It's just not possible. If we want to give love, give love, give love, spread the love, but we don't love ourselves, that ain't going to happen. If we want to help someone else, you know, if we want to kind of mirror their value for them and help them see their value, but we don't value ourselves, that ain't going to happen. We want to help somebody be more confident, but we're not confident. We're, we're insecure. Well, that's not going to happen either. We can't be, you know, super, super generous if we're coming from a place of scarcity. That just, it isn't how it works. You know, we want our cup to overflow with all of it so that we've got plenty, plenty to give ourselves and the whole world. And it's really the best thing, not only the best thing we can do for us, ourselves, it's the best thing we can do for the world. Think about it. When our cup's overflowing, we got the world by the ass. We got plenty to give. We're not depleted because we're giving from this place of authenticity. It just, it just keeps flowing, flowing, flowing. And then we've got so much to give everyone around us, whether we know them, don't know them, whatever. Super important. So I like how, and I think Oprah's one is, well, lots of people say this, but my, uh, my friend Oprah says, what is in the cup is for us. What overflows is for everyone else. So I started out the article talking about, um, you know, talking about personal growth and when we sort of have this desire, we're kind of ignited to make positive changes. It often seems when we're in this place of really wanting to make some positive lasting change that we focus on the external stuff. You know, we'll say things to ourselves such as, gee, I should really go to the gym more, right? I should eat more veggies, start saving money and, and learn to set boundaries. And, and, and the should word actually, um, is a reflection of rigid thinking anyway, like the shoulda, coulda, wouldas and all that stuff. Instead of saying, I'm excited to do whatever, excited to do whatever, eat veggies. So these are biggies. So we have the exercise thing, the veggies thing. Money is a big one for lots of people too. And then learn to set boundaries. Well, we, of course, somebody might just say, well, I'm just not that good at setting boundaries. Well, okay. There are a couple of things here I want to address with that one. The words I am or I am not, are really powerful and you want to be super careful about what follows those words. If you say, I am, I am, you know, tired, guess what you guess how you're going to feel. You know, you might even pass tired into exhausted, into fatigue because you're making, you're making a, a, not just a statement, but kind of like a declaration. Everybody notice I'm exhausted. Okay. It doesn't mean you're not tired, but when we, when we amp it up to talking about it, making it bigger than it needs to be, we're going to, we're going to feel a bigger type of tired than if we didn't do that. So if we say I am depressed, well, you're certainly, again, not saying somebody isn't having some de depressive thinking or whatever, not minimizing that. It's just, we don't, if we kind of get really verbal about talk, you know, kind of ba -ba 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 all the time, um, that isn't really helping us rather than, you know, somebody, you know, obviously finding maybe professional treatment. That's a good idea. Or, and if it's maybe not at that level and somebody's just more in the sad range, talking to a good friend, all these kind of things, but just walking around saying, I am, I am, I am really just strengthens it. If there's not really a plan to move forward or whatever it is, fill in the blank with whatever it is. And so I am not is the same thing. So I am not confident. Well, walking around saying that, making that declaration isn't, isn't helping. And, or I'm not a good boundary setter isn't helping because really what that statement is saying, 
I don't value myself. Okay. I don't. Value. So rather than that, rather than stating that, reinforcing it and making it stronger, it's a much better idea to change our vocabulary, right? Um, I'm becoming a better boundary setter. I'm practicing worthiness. I've now learned that I'm learning how I've now learned myself that we teach people how to treat us. Now that I'm aware of this, I'm, I'm a work in progress with it. I'm excited to learn to set more boundaries, to change our vocabulary. If we're in a, if, if we're in a, a sad place, you know, um, and I'm not saying not to feel is to heal, heal. I'm not saying it ever in any way to not feel how you feel for sure. It's just that it's obviously if we've got to eventually make a shift out of that. Oh, actually, I guess we don't have to, but we want to make a shift out of that into a more positive place after we've processed and everything like that. And so that takes some conscious effort. You know, okay, I was, I've always, I've really been sad for a bit and now um, I'm ready to really, you know, I'm ready to make, you know, make some conscious moves to, to shift out of that. I'm ready to make a conscious move to shift into a place of, of feeling more worthy. I'm ready to shift to a new place of feeling my value. I'm ready to surround myself with other people who are also knowing their value as well. So when we're talking about all these externals, you know, I, I, I start to talk about how, you know, what it seems so intuitive to when we look at the nutrition and the exercise, the saving money, those three are, are, you know, very, 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 very typical. And then the boundaries one is pretty common as well. So why does it seem so intuitive for us to look at why it might be, I'm sorry, the other way around. Why does it not seem as intuitive as, as the veggies, the exercise, the boundary setting, the saving money, when we, for us to take a look at why it's so difficult for us to take care of ourselves. So this is the big question. Why is it sometimes so difficult for us to take care of ourselves? Why is it much easier to take care of other people sometimes? Why is it easier for some people to take care of others before themselves? And why are we looking um, for our good feels to come from alcohol, shopping, people pleasing as a biggie, um, or maybe possibly an, um, an addiction to a packed schedule. So I'll just re- repeat that. Why can it be much easier to take care of other people before ourselves? Why are the good, why do we often sort of chase down the good feels to come down from al- to come from alcohol, shopping, people pleasing, or being addicted to a packed schedule of busyness? We cannot take care of a self we do not value. That is the main theme theme here. We cannot take care of a self we do not value. And then I sort of get into um, how unworthiness is at the root. It is at the source of people pleasing, rescuing, and burnout. So, okay, so let's just start here because I say, simply put, we cannot give what we do not have. This is quite basic as if the well is dry um there is no water to give yet we continue to try as if there were a purple heart waiting for us to prove to the world that we are willing to run ourselves into the ground for external approval however we are not always aware that the craving for external approval and the compulsive need to swoop in and meet the needs of others before ourselves Come back to the lack of feeling worthy. Oh my gosh, so true. And people pleasing is so common. Rescuing, which is a close cousin. It's related, but it's kind of amped up a little bit. Close cousin. So that's often people are flying around with this, you know, big ass Superman, Superwoman on their chest. Um, And we're not talking about being a a regular good person coming from from an authentic place. Authentic giving is mindful. Whereas ego driven, codependent, people pleasing behavior is, is, uh, not, it's inauthentic. It's coming from a place of the ego and it's coming from a place of, um, seeking out worthiness from external sources. When somebody's authentic and they're giving authentically, helping someone else authentically, it's not, it's not because there's a need for the dope fix of somebody else's approval. Not at all. It's just an authentic giving and it's not depleting. It's life giving. And that's how we know the difference. So I actually, I look, look at that. I I got ahead of myself here because right there, the next, I get into that next. So it says, it is also important to distinguish between mind full giving and mind less giving 
Mind full giving is authentic and rejuvenating, whereas mind less giving is driven by the ego's need for approval and appreciation. This leaves us feeling depleted and may lead to resentment. Oh my gosh, I, for, I just forgot to this till this second that I get into the giving tree, which is my least favorite children's book there is. In fact, I can't even think of a second one. This is the only one I don't like, <laughs> I think, that I've ever read. My, and I despise it. Mind, mindless Giving reminds me of the children's book, The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. And if you haven't read the story, I'll just give you a little blip about it. The story is about a tree and a little boy. And then as the boy grows up, he, he sort of continues to ask the tree um, for her to give him, to forgive to him in various ways. So first it's her shade. Then it's the branches, her branches to build a house. Then it's her apples to sell for money. And his last ask, his last big ask, is a request to cut down her trunk to make a canoe. I mean, think about this. So the tree is the mom, right? Giving, 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 giving. Eventually gives even her trunk. So finally, when the little boy uh, grew into a tired old man, and the, 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 the illustrations in this are good. They really depict it well. Um, uh, his last, sorry, his bat, last big ask is for her to cut down the trunk to make a canoe. And then he was this old tired man. He approaches the tree one last time, telling her he needed a quiet place to sit and rest a quiet place to to sit and rest. And I just remember all the hype about how wonderful this book is. And I'm thinking, oh my God, rather than call it the giving tree, we should really call it codependency for kids. It's horrible. And I certainly wouldn't want to, to not just read this to my own kids. I wouldn't want to have them in any way, you know, and have that any kind of a role modeling situation for for my children you know the boys or the girls either way and so at the end of the story of course as the tree had given the man everything she had all all that was left was a stump and so the tree responded with well an old stump is good for sitting and resting come boy sit down sit down and rest the old man sat on the stump and the book ends with quote, and the tree was happy, end quote. Seriously? So this is what I say. This is codependency for kids. This is crazy. No one would aspire to become a stump. No one would aspire to become a stump. And I certainly as a mother wouldn't have wanted to, to role model burnout and complete depletion and emotional, cognitive, and spiritual bankruptcy to my children. That's just so crazy it's just nuts and so then um really i I get into the characteristics of burnout and um i get into the fact that the characteristics of burnout the symptoms of depression are really not much different and so and then i've got a picture of a stump here which is kind of illustrates the point and then i talk about we teach people how to treat us like we've been saying so that's just the fact jack and it's it's energetic too. We can it's also verbal, um, but we also put out an energy because when somebody is not feeling valuable, they put out a needy energy. They put out doormat energy, to be quite specific. So uh, I say, like it or not, we are all walking balls of energy, sending out messages all day long. You know, we just putting out. We're going to put it out there all day long. So if you've ever noticed somebody walk into the room, right? If they're oozing with authentic confidence, most often just heads turn, people listen. And, you know, they just have this energy, very attractive. I don't mean just physically, it it can just attractive energy. Just, you have this inviting energy, this emotional availability, this like oozing of confidence. So, so they have a certain charismatic energy that's captivating. Authentic, authenticity, um, has swag. Authenticity has swag. So the opposite is also true when one is not feeling worthy. Unworthiness, unworthiness presents insecure and needy energy, which people also pick up on rather quickly and unconsciously configure these messages into their programming to evaluate the interaction. So this is, okay, so there is a spectrum 
of doormat vibes, basically, this is what I'm saying. There's a spectrum of doormat vibes to respect me vibes. And they're trying to figure out where you land on this spectrum and how they should treat you. So here it goes. The sobering truth is if you don't treat yourself well, no one else will either. And this all comes down to worthiness. All right. So here goes. So a common example is a dating relationship when one partner is mistreated by the other, right? She breaks up with them and then lo and behold, a new partner shows up wearing a different outfit. This is so, 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 so common. This will continue indefinitely until she does the inner work of worthiness practice. So then you might ask, all right, where are we going this? Is, is she going to, is she going to tell us how to, how to start feeling worthy? Uh, yes, I am. Of course. So this is how we wind things up on a nice positive note. So the practice of worthiness. So first, number one is to drop the stigma. So the first thing to do is let go of thoughts of self-care as being selfish, unless you want to label it, you know, new, new selfish, good selfish, or something else. Um, because if, the, the, if you label it as your new selfish, which is healthy and full of value, well, that's great. Then I have the, uh, Hashtag self care is not selfish. So start a gratitude journal each day after you wake up and before anything else, even maybe other than getting that cup of coffee or tea, not judging. I'm a, I, I have, I have the caffeine right next to me, actually. Then jot down three things you are grateful for. These must include the words I am grateful for, and then fill in the rest. After about 21 days, you'll notice a difference. And as this is the approximate time it takes for a habit to shift and stick. Gratitude, after all, is the master key to happiness. Um, And number three is mirror work. So while you're already on the gratitude track, step in front of the mirror every day, just every day. Wake up, look at yourself in the eyes and tell yourself something you're grateful for about yourself, you know. And and once you sort of, um, once you sort of gain strength from this everyday exercise. Tell yourself, I love you. Just go for the gold. Tell yourself just how amazing you are. So then the fourth one is set the bar for doing your best because this is important in general is doing our best is all we can ask of ourselves or do on any given day. So if you're doing well with your worthiness practice and then, you know, you find yourself sliding into a moment of you have a little self-deprecation or you're just not being so good to yourself, right? Show yourself some kindness and patience, you know, just take a deep breath, start your day over no matter what time it is. Just pull yourself up by the bootstraps and say, you know, go me, I'm back at it. So number five, be as present, I'm sorry, be present as much as possible to strengthen our inner lives by becoming acquainted with our authentic selves. We need to be present at this moment. This is how we become aware of old, unhealthy patterns of thinking and the emotions attached to the thoughts. All right, six is clear out the junk. Being present brings awareness, which only get better. So as we begin to become more aware of old patterns, clogging up our they clog up our minds like I'm thinking of plumbing right now, like when you have a clogged pipe. That really that just came to my mind. I didn't even write that in here. But so we, we want to, as we become aware of old patterns, clogging up our minds, we can begin the process of clearing out the junk to make way for new and healthy ways of thinking. This is, this is, um, think of this as mental spring cleaning. Oh, I love that. Forgot I wrote that. Okay. And that's seven reprogram. So once we begin to clear out the junk of toxic self-talk and negative emotion, we have paved the way to begin we have paved the way to begin replacing the old patterns of thought with brand new dialogue full of positivity and self value. And then eight is fake it till you make it. And this is a lot, this is said a lot out there. You know, um, this is like an old trick that works like a charm if you're just getting started with it. So pull your shoulders back, hold yourself in a confident posture and make good eye contact. Just remember that we can learn to become comfortable feeling uncomfortable while we adjust and that people are not mind readers. They can't see what you are telling yourself. And then uh, nine is start setting boundaries. 
Now that you've advanced with your worthiness practice, you are ready to begin or perhaps improve with it wherever you, you know, land on your, on your journey, you know, setting boundaries. So once you can consistently set appropriate boundaries without, you know, hesitating or feeling guilt, well then congratulate yourself, you know, go me as you've earned your black belt in worthiness. So good, as I mentioned earlier, good boundary setters know their value. They know their value, rock solid. I'm, I'm willing to do this, this, that, and this, and not that. They don't feel guilty. They don't feel awkward. They don't feel any of it. They're being respectful. Just this, that isn't good for me. So it's okay, move on to somebody else. And doing a happy dance to celebrate this huge success is very okay. Um, surround yourself with good people. I'm a huge one on that. I have great people in my life. People who value themselves tend to hang around others who do the same. That is a gigantic, very true statement right there. Authenticity attracts authenticity. This also means that you may need to weed the garden a bit as far as detaching from or spending less time with those who may not bring growth or joy to you anymore. You got to make a life minute budget because especially people are bringing you down then you sure as heck don't need to spend time with them. But there's even a corner kind of, there's either kind of um, middle zone where they're just dry white toast. You know, that's, they're not bringing you joy. Maybe they're not bringing you down either, but you want to save those life minutes and, 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 you know, hang around people who keep themselves filled up so you can learn to do the same. So, and the last one is to keep yourself filled up. So this is our number one job. We talked about it. We need to keep our fills up keep ourselves, sorry, keep ourselves filled up, keep our cups filled and overflowing. What is in, what is inside is for us. Whatever overflows is for everybody else. What is in, what is inside the cup is for us. Whatever overflows is for everybody else. Like anything else where we invest our energy is where we improve. Again, there is no worthiness fair. You sprinkle self-value dust on us. We must put effort in each day as we inevitably improve our practice. Worthiness is no different. Okay, so this is one of my favorite topics, actually. And I'll tell you, part of my, my, part of my per- personal mission, I wouldn't say I have a personal mission statement. Um, however, I know for a fact I was put on this earth to educate about... Um, positivity, mindset, happiness, life satisfaction, all of it. And definitely helping people to see their own value is part of the thread. There's no question. And I've got some real tried and true experience with that myself. And most of you know the backstory. I grew up in a really you know, challenging, turbulent, sometimes violent situation. And I'm very aware of what it felt like decades ago to not feel worthy, not, to not be able to to see my own value yet and I know about the whole gradual process with it and which uh, really helps you know empathetically and knowledge wise and experience wise and everything to be able to have that lens to see when other people are going through this you know the same or similar similar thing it really helps it helps me to help them see their own value I guess is what I'm saying and it's just wonderfully fulfilling and rewarding to to be able to be that sort of channel, I guess, of helping people see their own value because val- you know, see, being able to see our own value and keeping ourselves filled up is number one. So I just want to say, I wish you all well. Stay with it. It all gets, it's such a rewarding process. It, it takes takes work, takes effort. So worth it in the end. You'll get lighter and lighter and lighter, learning how to like and love yourself and uh, blessings, everyone. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from the beautiful yet rainy northern Vermont. Have a mindful day.